Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Hebrews chapter 13. It's near the end of the Bible. Feel free to use the table of contents if you need to. Hebrews chapter 13. And as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Arlington and Moco and PW and Loudoun and online. It's good to be together around God's Word. Please forgive my voice a bit today. Along with about half of the DMV, I'm a bit under the weather right now. Uh, but I did not want to miss this Sunday in light of something we're going to do together a few minutes from now. We're in week 11 of 12 weeks in God's Word, seeing how every one of us needs a biblical church, how God has uniquely designed the church, unlike any other group or organization or gathering in the world, for our good. And how we will not experience, you will not, I will not experience our highest good without the church. And specifically without commitment to meaningful membership in a church. And to this point, we've seen 10 reasons why that's true, including some things that we know we need, like biblical prayer or biblical worship last week, to some things we may not at least instinctually think we need, like, do I need biblical giving? Do I need biblical accountability and discipline? Which leads to what we're going to look at today, at how you need biblical leadership in your life. And I need biblical leadership in my life. We need a church where we are led by people according to the Bible. And I'm going to use we or you and I very intentionally throughout our time today because even as an elder or pastor in this church, I need other elders and pastors and leaders in this church in my life. But here's the deal. In our sinful nature, we don't think we need this. We think, I don't don't need to follow somebody else. I'm quite capable of leading my own life. And as a result, even when somebody is in a leadership position, we think, well, it doesn't mean I have to follow their leadership. But listen to the Bible. So this is God speaking to you and me about leaders in the church. And listen to what God says. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, of course you would choose this text to preach on as a leader in the church. Of course, you would find the verse in the Bible that says people are supposed to obey and submit to and make you happy. (laughs) And you might even go so far as to think this is what's wrong in the church. Leaders who crave this kind of power, wield this kind of influence, And you know, I'd actually agree with you. There are so many examples, more than any of us would like to count, of leaders craving power and wielding influence in unhelpful and even harmful ways, even in the church. We've all seen headlines of scandals and sexual abuse that absolutely are what is wrong with the church, but that's just it. Those headlines happen because those leaders are not leading biblically in the church. And the consequences of bad leadership in the church are personally devastating and far-reaching, which is why you and I need good leaders who lovingly, caringly, selflessly, and biblically lead us to experience life to the full in Jesus. 
And to be clear, it's not just Christians who need good leaders in the church. The world needs good leaders in the church. Some of you may be visiting today, you may be exploring Christianity. We are so glad you're here. And I trust that even if you're not a Christian, you hate and you're sickened by self-seeking, self-interested, self-promoting, and self-protecting leaders anywhere, and especially in the church. So let's think together then about what God is saying in his word here about how we need biblical leaders who we can obey and submit to, knowing even these words, obey and submit, have such negative connotations. So let's pause for a moment and realize what the Bible is not saying here. The Bible is not promoting one absolute obedience to authoritarian leadership. The Bible never says to do whatever a demanding or dictatorial or even despotic leader in this world says to do. Acts chapter 5, verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. If anyone in any role of leadership is ever telling us to do that which is disobedient to God and his word, then we should not obey or submit to that leadership. So we know this is not God promoting absolute obedience to authoritarian leadership over him in this world, no. And second, the Bible is not promoting abuse of power all throughout the Old Testament. And we're reading this in Amos right now in our church's Bible reading plan. God rebukes leaders among his people for abusing their own power for their own gain, which is why when you get to the New Testament, what does God say to elders? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, shepherd the flock that is of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And Jesus made this clear all throughout the Gospels that power is a gift from God to be used to serve people. Mark chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Indeed, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, referring to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. God makes very clear in his word that he is promoting service toward people, not abuse of power. And then, so follow this, the Bible is also not promoting here any kind of acknowledgement of inequality, sometimes When we hear submission, we think inequality. Someone who submits is inferior to someone else who is superior. If two people are equal, we think, and there's no submission involved. This is where we need to guard ourselves, especially in our culture and our country, where we can so exalt freedom to the point that any kind of authority is seen as oppressive or evil. When that is not true, according to God, authority and accountability and submission to good leaders is a really good thing. Jesus himself, the Son of God, what we're about to celebrate at Christmas, takes on human flesh and submits to his Father. Not as I will, but as you will. Yet his submission does not strike in any way at his dignity. Or think of human relationships. When the Bible says that a child should obey their parents, that doesn't mean that a child is less dignified than their parents in any way. When God tells a wife in Ephesians chapter 5 to submit to a husband's loving, sacrificial leadership, that doesn't mean a wife is any less than her husband in any way. Now, obviously, there can be abuses of that authority in marriage or parenting. And any other spheres. But that doesn't mean submission and authority in and of themselves are bad things. They are good things designed by God for our good. So how is this good for us? Why is God telling us to obey and submit to leaders in the church? 
And I, I should just pause here for a moment to make sure we're on the same page when we're thinking about who leaders in the church are according to God. So what are the, who are the leaders that God is talking about here? And if you turn back just a few pages in your Bible, you'll come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, just a couple of pages back where you see two primary kinds of leaders in the church, elders and deacons. And we're not going to spend exhaustive time in this text. We've studied before when we've talked about biblical leadership. So you can go back to those sermons if it'd be helpful. But let's just read real quickly 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13 to make sure we're on the same page with the kinds of leaders God is talking about obeying and submitting to. And I think Hebrews th chapter 13, verse 17 will start to make a lot more sense. Follow along in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. And I should just point out that that word overseer there is used interchangeably in the New Testament with the word elder, what we commonly refer to as a pastor. So whenever you see one of these words in terms of leadership in the church, they're talking about the same group of people, elder, overseer, pastor. So 1 Timothy 3, 2 continues. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So these are the qualifications 1 Timothy 3 outlines for overseers or elders or pastors in the church. And you can see a similar list of qualifications in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. And then in verse 9, the Bible talks about another group of leaders and their qualifications in the church, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And I should point out that back up in verse 11, you probably see a note in your Bible when it says uh, their wives likewise. There's a little note that probably takes you down in your Bible that says that could mean just wives or women likewise must be dignified, referring to women deacons. But to summarize, so these verses, 1 Timothy chapter 3, just we just read, describe the Two primary groups of leaders in the church. Elders who oversee the church, that's the group of leaders, specifically men entrusted with the authority to teach and care for and pastor, shepherd the church. And then deacons as men and women who lead out in different ministries across the church to meet specific needs. One example of it's Acts chapter 6 as they oversee the distribution of food to people in need. And these standards for leadership in 1 Timothy chapter 3, are clearly outlined by God. And we could talk a lot about these character qualifications, but for the most part, I think you'll notice they're really just expectations for every follower of Jesus, which is kind of the point. These are men and women who are supposed to lead in the church by example. In other words, the leaders we're obeying and submitting to should be people whose lives look like Jesus. Which now leads us back. So Hebrews 13, we read verse 17 about obeying and submitting to leaders. But that's actually not the first time Hebrews 13 mentions leaders in the church. So go back there with me to Hebrews chapter 13 and look at verse 7. Ten verses before that, the author of Hebrews says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. I love this. The whole point of leadership in the church is to point people to Jesus Christ. So now it's starting to make sense 
why you and I need biblical leadership in the church. We need people who are doing, so watch this, two main things here. We need leaders who speak the word of God to us faithfully and continually. Remember your leaders who did what? Who spoke to you the word of God. And now it starts to make sense. If leaders in the church are speaking the word of God to you, then of course you should do what? Obey and submit to leaders. Because we are obeying and submitting to the word of God that they're speaking. Yes, we need people speaking the word of God to us like this. Faithfully, I emphasize that word in light of the context around here in Hebrews chapter 13. Look right after this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. The Bible says, do not let, be led away by diverse and strange teachings. And it goes into some specific examples of diverse and strange teachings at that, at that point that the people of God needed to avoid. We need leaders who are teaching God's word to us faithfully. Which is why, if you remember back in 1 Timothy chapter 3, what we just read, talking specifically about the role of elders and pastors and overseers, it says they must be able to teach. It's interesting, out of all the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, all these qualifications are character qualifications except for this one, competency qualification. An elder, overseer, pastor must be able to teach God's word because their whole leadership in the church is Contingent on speaking the word of God to others. So he must be stewarding that gift faithfully. Remember the very first week of this series when we saw our need for biblical preaching and teaching and we read 2 Timothy chapter 4? Remember these words from God to his people? He said, I charge you. Or actually, this is speaking directly to leaders. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with great patience, with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. In other words, you and I don't need leaders in the church who tell us what we want to hear. We need leaders in the church who are telling us what God says regardless of whether we want to hear it. And if that means we are, uh, sorry, reproved or rebuked or exhorted, we need leaders who will teach God's word to us faithfully and continually. Deuteronomy chapter 6, which we looked at last week, you and I need leaders who God's word is just flowing from them all the time whose lips and lives are overflowing with the word of God. And then, okay, so now back to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke to you the word of God, who do that faithfully and continually. And then we need leaders whose faith and way of life is worthy of imitation. So watch this. We need leaders who speak the word of God to us faithfully and continually, and we need leaders who imitate the life of Jesus helpfully and humbly. And we all know this, right? Think about just on the most general level. Think about people in your life who you're a better person just for being around that person. Don't you want people like that in your life? We just make you better by being around them. Well, that's God's design for leadership in the church. That's why I put helpfully here. The whole picture there in Hebrews 13, 7 and 8 is we need people in our lives whose influence in our lives helps us look like Jesus, helps us look more to Jesus, which is why I also put humbly here, knowing that no leader in the church is perfect. Myself, first and foremost. And every leader in the church needs Jesus. 
And praise God, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no other leader like Jesus. We want people in our lives whose faith in Jesus draws us closer to him. We need leaders like that. So now, put it all together, and hopefully we're getting a different perspective on Hebrews 13 and 17. Obey your leaders, submit to their authority. That command starts to make sense. We start to realize how good it is for us when those leaders are doing what? They're teaching the word of God to us faithfully and continually. They're imitating the life of Jesus before us, helpfully and humbly. And then keep going to God's next description of them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So third and finally here, we need leaders who care for us responsibly and joyfully. It's an awesome image what God gives us here in his word. People who are keeping watch over your soul, caring for somebody's soul. Do you see God's kindness toward you and me here? Obviously, he is ultimately the one who keeps watch over our souls. But don't miss what he's saying here. God gives leaders in the church, in your life and my life, to keep watch over us as a reflection of his care for us. I think about times when we leave our kids at home with someone to care for them and how important it is that this person will watch over them responsibly. I've used the illustration before. Think of our five kids at home while we're still waiting to bring one home through adoption. Can you imagine us leaving our five kids in someone's care and then coming back home And there are only being three kids in the house. And Heather and I ask, uh, where are the other two? And the person entrusted with the care of our children says, I'm not sure where they are. But three out of five isn't bad, right? 60%. I mean, that'll get you through Major League Baseball, NBA, and the Hall of Fame. 60% is pretty good. And part of the reason I use this illustration is because up to this point, I'm guessing, as we've been talking about this, you've been thinking about leaders in the church, and specifically what's come to your mind is pastors like myself or Mike or maybe location pastors, as you should, because we are obviously in leadership positions in the church. But this church has thousands of people who need care for their souls. And two or three or 10 or 20 Pastors can't do that responsibly before God, which is why one of the conclusions I hope you take away from this word today is we need a lot of leaders across this church. And God may be calling you to be one. This is why you hear us talking all the time about church groups, why we're moving and working to see every member of this church in a church group led by somebody or some people who are keeping watch over all of our souls, who are caring for our souls. That's why eventually we want as many of these church groups as possible to be led by a church group pastor, not necessarily somebody who stands up here on stage and preaches to the whole church, but other leaders Pastors across the church who are saying, we're going to make sure we're caring for every single person's soul, which is why we take church membership seriously and all 12 traits of this church seriously, because I, we don't want to stand before God and say, we took care of 60% of them. That's pretty good, right? Or even 80 or 90%. No. No. And this is where you as a member of this church family can help leaders in this church family by saying, okay, if the leaders of my church before God are trying to care for my soul, trying to provide as biblical a church as possible for my good, then unless they're telling me to do something that goes against God's word, I will follow their leadership. I'll work to get into a church group. I'll 
Let go of this or that way of doing things that I've always done or this program that I love. If the people God has provided to care for my soul are leading me in a different way. I think about the invitation a couple of weeks ago to potentially move somewhere else in the world for the spread of the gospel. We have a process in place to help you discern if God is leading you in that way and what that might look like. So it's helpful for you to say, unless they are leading me to go against God's word, I'll go through that process and follow their leadership. And let's just put it out there. This is so different than the way we are wired to think and work. We think and work like we're going to do this on our own, regardless of what somebody else says. But God is saying it is good for you to follow leaders in the church whom he has entrusted to teach God's word to you and to keep watch over your soul, which means you need to be in a church where you can do this. In other words, if you're not willing to obey and submit to leadership in a particular church, you need to find a church where you can obey Hebrews 13, 17. You don't need to be in a church where you are disobeying God's word in Hebrews 13, 17. Which then leads to the last part of this verse and why I say not just responsibly but joyfully, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So is this me saying to you, on my behalf, on behalf of other leaders in this church, it's time for you to make me, us, happy. It's in God's word. So do it. Well, in a sense, yes. But listen to the way the Bible talks about joy and happiness in church leaders. There are so many places in Scripture. I I just started diving in as I'm preparing for today, and there are so many different places I'd love to go, but we'd be here another hour that just depict the joyful relationship, relationship between leaders and members of a church. But my favorite one, I'll take you to one, is 3 John 1, 4, where John is writing as a spiritual father to a church of spiritual children of his, and he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And that's it, Right? They don't miss it. We all know this with physical children. If you have physical, don't, isn't it, doesn't it bring you great joy to see your children thrive? And so it's like, I'm a happy man. And my children are growing and thriving in this way or that way. And so in the church. I can totally testify to this verse right here. My greatest joy as a leader in this church family is seeing members of this church family grow in your relationship with Jesus. Without question, seeing you receive God's word and walk in obedience to it, seeing you share God's word and lead other people to Jesus. You want to make a church leader's day? Tell them how you share the gospel and somebody is now going to be in heaven for all of eternity as a result of their obedience to the word. Seeing you care for each other. Think about circumstances right now in our church family, some really hard pictures of suffering and death and seeing brothers and sisters come alongside each other and walk with each other through that. Seeing you say a couple of weeks ago, God, I'll spread the gospel to unreached people no matter what it costs, and I'm going to explore what that looks like with total surrender in my heart. Seeing you take radical risks to follow Jesus in your workplace, in this city, among the nations. So now it all makes sense. When leaders in the church are teaching the word of God and imitating the life of Jesus and keeping watch over people's souls and people in the church are obeying and submitting to that kind of leadership, there is much joy to be had by all. So God help us then. That's Hebrews 13, 18. Right after verse 17, the writer of Hebrews, a leader in the church says, pray for us. For we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. Pray for us. Pray for me, church. Pray for other leaders in this church that we would lead like Hebrews 13 and 1 Timothy 3 are describing. And pray that we as members of the church would follow leaders like this in ways that lead to their joy and our good and God's glory. 
which leads me to a moment I've been looking forward to that flows directly from this word from God. So I want to ask Larry and Phyllis Cooper and Wayne and Kaz Fajito to join me up here along with some of our other elders and their wives and two of our other lead pastors, Wade and Mike. So amidst a variety of things going on around our election of elders last summer, we did not have time and proper opportunity to appropriately honor these two brothers and their wives who have served as elders in our church family for many years. So Larry, since 2001, and 17 of those years as chairman of our elders, and Wayne since 2015. So I want to ask a way to share a bit about God's grace in Wayne and Cause, and then Mike to do the same for Larry and Phyllis. And then I want to give us an opportunity as church family to thank God for his grace and these brothers and their wives who have faithfully made so many sacrifices to lead in this church. So Wade, why don't you start? Thanks, David. Good morning. Um, it is an incredible privilege for me to have the uh, opportunity to recognize both Wayne and Kaz. Uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that one of the real privileges of the last few years for me being at McLean Bible Church has been the opportunity to get to know Wayne uh, and to serve alongside him in big things and small things and all kinds of different ways. There are, uh, I'm not exaggerating in this either, hundreds of things that I could share with you that I've seen uh, in this couple over the past couple of years, but I thought it might be best just to share the first, one of the first interactions uh, that I had with uh, these two, and then the most recent interaction that I had, and I think that'll give you a little bit of a picture of their heart for service for this church family. Um, when I first moved here, uh, it was right in the midst of the pandemic. It was when everything was shut down, including restaurants and hotels and all of that. Some people here at the church were very kind to find a place for us to live in that transitional season. Um, but we did not know anybody here other than about 10 or 15 people on staff. And so I was very surprised one night to get a knock on the door. Uh, I didn't know anybody out in the community. I didn't have any idea who would be knocking on our door. Um, but it was Wayne. Uh, holding a lasagna that Kaz made for me. And, uh, and so in my thank you note, I shared with Kaz that my first 11 meals here were me eating her lasagna uh, <laughs> by myself in the kitchen of this house that everybody found for me. And so um, I've had the pleasure of, of eating a lot of things that she's cooked over the uh, last couple of years. And I just want to say to both of you guys, thank you for that first act of hospitality. Most recently, and again, this is not out of the norm in any way. Uh, last weekend, I had the privilege of walking into a fellowship that Wayne leads. Uh, he was the worship leader that day and making an announcement to that group that we would be doing this today uh, in their honor. And we were inviting everybody to, to come and be a part of this with us. Uh, as we were talking, people were coming up to Wayne and asking to make adjustments in the way that they were going to do their order of worship that day. And in the midst of all of that, Wayne asked me if I would be willing to come even later that day and pray for a military appreciation lunch. That you guessed it, Wayne was the one who was uh, behind creating and then leading and organizing uh, that recognition for all of our veterans. And I shared with that group that it has been my practice for the last two years that when Wayne asked me to do something, I say yes without asking any details. And so uh, that's just an example of a normal Sunday uh, in the life of Wayne and Kaz. They have served this family, this church family faithfully for a long time. As David said, for Wayne, uh, two successive terms on the elder board uh, since 2015, and it's been, uh, again, one of the real privileges. So I want to ask you guys uh, to join me in, in honoring them. First, we have a small gift for Kaz, and I would love for us to appreciate all of the sacrifice for her that went into supporting Wayne in this role. Kaz, thank you. We mean that. Thank you. And then for Wayne, we have a small plaque recognizing uh, all that he has done here at McLean Bible Church. I also want to ask you guys, and you'll hear this invitation a number of times, to come and say uh, thank you to Wayne and Kaz personally uh, after this service. But would you join me in saying thank you to Wayne as well? And Ken, would you give that presentation to him? We're going to make our way to the end of the line now and let Mike uh, step up with this next group and we'll honor all of them together. Thank you, guys.
Well, it's a joy for me to be able uh, to honor uh, Larry and Phyllis. Uh, we joke as uh, location pastors who serve at uh, other locations other than Tyson's that we get a lot of freedom to kind of do what we want and lead however we want. That is not true, however, when the chairman of the elder board attends your location. And so, uh, so it, it really has been a joy. I was thinking about, um, uh, as David was preaching about leadership, I was thinking about Hebrews 13, 7. And it says, remember those who spoke the word of God to you. And this is what struck me. It says, consider, and this, this is the word, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And I've seen you two serve in so many uh, ways. Uh, Larry and Phyllis both obviously serving all of our locations um, in the elder capacity. Larry uh, so faithfully as the chairman of our elder board for so long. But a lot of people don't see the ways that they serve uh, across our church, whether it's uh, random times where I'm like, hey, Ms. Phyllis, I need you to meet with this woman. Uh, or serving an international Bible fellowship on Friday nights or the many, many, many years you, Ms. Phyllis, served in teaching women not just the Bible, but how to study the Bible, uh, and the fruit, fruitfulness out of that that I get to see and experience, as there's women now who sit under your teaching, who now teach other people, and we get to benefit from that. Larry, your uh, encouragement constantly and correction, uh, I've appreciated, and honestly, I'm a, a man of God and the pastor that I am, because of those conversations that we had and the ways you've constantly nudged me and encouraged me. But here's the greatest example, I think, of the outcome of their way of life. Ms. Phyllis, you might remember this. I got the opportunity, some of us, to be at their 60th wedding uh, anniversary. Yeah. And at that uh, small gathering, uh, we just enjoyed some time over dinner and enjoyed some time just worshiping the Lord together. But Ms. Phyllis said something uh, that I never forgot, and she was talking to Larry. She said, Larry, this is, these were her words. She says, I can only think of one time he's ever said he was going to do something and didn't do it. And she said, and it was because he got sick. And I was like, in 60 years now, that created some really awkward conversations for my wife and I on the way home. <laughs> However, I was considering the outcome of your way of life, sir. And I'm just so thankful that not only have you served us faithfully as a church, but in the words of your wife, you've served your family uh, faithfully. And so we want to honor the two of you, Ms. Phyllis. We want to first uh, just honor you for your service to our church. And Jenny's going to uh, present you with these flowers. Can we give it up? And uh, Larry, we want to honor you uh, as well uh, with a plaque that uh, Patrick is going to give you. Um, but I also wanted to let you know, and this will be a surprise to you, uh, and uh, this will be a surprise to all of you, uh, that we are uh, renaming Larry under his leadership uh, has uh, been a part of distributing uh, over $7 million through our benevolence fund to people in our church uh, who just have material needs. And we thought one of the best ways to honor your service and your legacy in our church was to name our benevolence fund after you. So it's no longer just the benevolence fund, but the Larry Cooper benevolence fund. And uh, you deserve that for your faithful service. So can we thank him? And Patrick, can you present him with this plaque? We love you both. Jim, I think Jim has uh, that recognition of the Benevolence Fund that we want to give to you specifically. And uh, there can be a plaque in the wall up here at Tyson's that will honor that. Uh, there's, there's two verses, uh, on one on the plaque that both Larry and Wayne got that uh, it's 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. We read it from it earlier, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So I'll just go ahead and acknowledge to both you brothers, that will fade what you have in your hands. But there's an unfading crown of glory that the Lord honors you with. And then this plaque with the Benevolence Fund, uh, just 
hereby proclaims that as of today, it's the Larry J. Cooper Benevolence Fund. And it has Acts 2.45, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. I wish you could know the stories over decades, literally, of this brother helping individuals and families who have faced all kinds of needs. And that's, that's the beauty of what leadership in the church is about. It's not just about being on a stage in front of people. It's about getting involved in the lives of people who are in need and showing the love of Christ. Both of these brothers and their wives would not want to be on stage right now. But enough convincing from God's word that it glorifies him to honor his grace in them brought them out here. And so can I one more time invite you to thank God for them. Y'all stay here. Y'all stay standing. I don't know if you're standing at other locations. If you're not, well, just it's fine. Just do whatever you are right now, but I want to pray. I want to lead us to pray. And let's gather around these guys, uh, these brothers and their wives, and let's just pray. God, we thank you for your grace in these two couples. I thank you, God, for your grace toward me and the sacrifices and the kindness and the character of Christ these brothers and their wives have shown to me and my family and have shown to many across this church family. We pray for your blessings on them. We pray that you would continually draw them into deeper intimacy with you, with each other, and that even though they're not serving in this role anymore, you would continue to use their lives and their leadership to build up this church, to make us look more like Jesus. And God, we pray that you would raise up multitudes of leaders, elders, overseers, pastors, deacons, men and women who are pointing us all to Jesus. Help us, God, to be a church marked by biblical leadership. We praise you, Lord Jesus, as the chief shepherd of our souls. And we pray that you'd help us to follow you ultimately and by your grace to follow leaders who are pointing us to you in the church. May it be so among us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you, guys.